Welcome to my video. Today we're going to talk about Syndrome of Inappropriate ADH. Uh, the acronym for that is going to be SIADH. So as always, let's begin with just a brief definition of what uh, SIADH. So in Syndrome of Inappropriate ADH, uh, you just have too much secretion of uh, ADH, also known as uh, vasopressin. And um, what this leads to, because ADH uh, ca causes reabsorption of water within the collecting ducts, so what you have is decreased water excretion. And so you kind of have like water uh, toxicity, in other words, of the body. And so let's briefly uh, go over physiology of ADH uh, so you can have a better idea of how this uh, actually occurs. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw a quick uh, hypothalamus and pituitary gland. So here we have, there you go. And so here's the anterior pituitary gland, which is uh, responsible for secreting many hormones, and the posterior pituitary gland, which is what we're going to be looking at today. And this uh, posterior pituitary gland, as, as you probably already are familiar, uh, secretes ADH and oxytocin. And this is all going to be under the control of the hypothalamus. So let's see what triggers the, the uh, synthesis and release of ADH. Well, what we have is we have these osmoreceptors, which uh, hook into the hypothalamus. And when this osmoreceptor detects high osmol uh, osmolarity of the blood, uh, the hypothalamus begins to produce uh, ADH. So this is going to be, these little red dots, I guess, represent uh, ADH. And it gets produced in the hypothalamus, and it gets stored in the posterior pituitary. So it accumulates here in the posterior pituitary, and then from here, uh, when it's needed, it gets released. And so what type of peripheral action does it have? Well, one action that it has is it activates the V1 receptors found on the blood vessels. And what this does is it causes vasoconstriction. So again, um, you know, the, the high plasma osmolality is what activates ADH. So this can also be caused by low volume. So this is one way to maintain blood pressure and volume. But this is not what we're going to be interested in today. Uh, the, this is not related to the pathophysiology we're talking about. The pathophysiology that we're going to be talking about is going to be related to the V2 receptor. And to get a better idea of how this works, I'm going to draw a quick nephron. So here we have the uh, proximal... Uh, so here we have the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and here's our collecting ducts. And in the collecting ducts is what we're really going to be focusing on. So as you know, there are cells lining the ducts. Uh, one of the cells that I'm going to kind of zoom in here on is going to be the principal cell. So here we're drawing the principal cell. Uh, on this right side, we have the lumen is where the urine is being formed. And on the left side is going to be blood where everything will be reabsorbed. Now within this principal cell, uh, there are these vesicles. And so lining the vesicles are going to be these uh, little channels. And these channels are called the aquaporin-2 channels. So uh, when ADH, and so these, these little green dots here represent the channel. And when ADH is present in the blood, it goes into the principal cell, and it activates this vesicle to go out towards the membrane, and it fuses with the membrane. And once it fuses with the membrane, those porin channels line the uh, line against the lumen of the uh, tubules and so as water is passing through they're going to go through the aquaporin channels out into the other side into the interstitium and finally the blood and so here on the nephron you can see so water becomes reabsorbed and everything and, and, and therefore it doesn't get excreted in the urine and so obviously if you have too much of this you can't excrete any water you're just retaining all the water that you've ever drank and so eventually um, you're going to get, uh, your urine is going to have high urine osmolality. So one of, the re the, one of the methods that your body has for maintaining high urine osmolality is from uh, ADH. And so without ADH, uh, it's going to be, uh, or with ADH, your, your urine osmolality can shoot through the roof. Look at uh, what's going wrong uh, in uh, SIADH and how that's causing uh, the pathology. So the pathophysiology all uh, revolves around uh, the patient is ingesting water, so he, he has ingestion of water, um, but he's not able to suppress ADH like he's normally supposed to, because of course when you ingest water, that uh, lowers your uh, plasma osmolality and you should be able to suppress water. So if you're not able to suppress ADH, uh, that eventually is going to lead to water retention. And so this is going to be, uh, water retention is going to be the pathophysiology, but as you're going to see right now, that's actually not where the problem lies. So you're going to have water retention, but Obviously, your body has other mechanisms to deal with it. So when you have increased total body water, uh, that increases the extracellular fluid volume. And so although you're not allowed to, uh, you can't, the, the patient uh, is, is, can't uh, lower ADH to combat the high total body water, you do have secondary natriuretic mechanisms. 
And natriuretic means uh, mechanisms that involve uh, losing salt and water. So what your body will do is it'll increase the atrial natriuretic protein, or peptide, excuse me, and it'll decrease the renin aldosterone adiotensin system. And so by decreasing these, you're able to actually restore the blood volume. So all this water retention uh, doesn't become as, as much of an issue because you're actually restoring the blood volume. But in order to do that, you're going to have to lose a lot of sodium. And so the patient ends up having hyponatremia or low plasma sodium. And this is actually going to be a bigger problem than the actual water retention because that gets restored by these secondary mechanisms. So you do, you do need to uh, kind of have, be very conscious of this uh, effect. So th that's kind of general uh, pathophysiology there, and I think that gives you a clear understanding of what you're dealing with. Now let's go ahead and move on to the clinical aspect of what's going on here. So the, the primary signs and symptoms of uh, SIADH is just basically the symptoms of hyponatremia. And these symptoms are primarily uh, neurological. So, you know, ne so basically the, the, the entire nervous system kind of begins to slowly shut down. So the patient is kind of malaise, uh, feeling tired, and they can get into a coma. And actually before coma, uh, they can just feel uptended where they're just not that active. Um, so, and, and so th those are the symptoms of SIH. There's no other symptoms specifically related to the ADH besides uh, if they have some of the underlying cause that might be uh, leading to these uh, SIADH to begin with, such as tumors or, or whatever that may be. Uh, so let's look at labs. So these patients will obviously have low plasma osmolality because they're retaining all the water. And because they're retaining all the water, they're di diluting that plasma sodium. And at the same time, because of the secondary natural uretic mechanisms, uh, the, the only way the body can get rid of water is actually losing sodium as well. So uh, uh, that also comes into play. The urine osmolality is going to still be high because, again, um, ADH keeps that high urine osmolality, and you don't want that. I mean, you already have a low plasma osmolality. Why are you trying to get rid of more? So they're going to be high. They're generally going to be greater than 100. Okay, and so then, and then, by the way, potassium will actually be normal, and that's generally attributed to the fact that you can have cellular shift, right? So the potassium within the cell can shift out and compensate for any loss or dilution uh, that might have occurred outside of the cell. And shift our focus to the etiology of syndrome of inappropriate ADH. So the first one we're going to look at is going to be CNS. So pretty much the way you want to think about it is anything that affects a CNS can give you SIH. So this could be a stroke, it could be due to a hemorrhage, uh, infections such as meningitis or encephalitis or any trauma to the head. Now one thing that you do want to keep in mind is in hemorrhage, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage can also lead to something else known as cerebral salt wasting. And this, this is important to differentiate because uh, there's different path, uh, pathologies underlying it, but they look the same. So in, in cerebral salt wasting, the ADH will also be high because, uh, and so it will think that you'll have SIADH, but that's secondary to salt wasting. So the patient is losing a lot of salt, becoming hypernatremia, and so then the body is secreting ADH to get rid of it. And so this, this is important to begin to differentiate the two as we talk about treatment uh, the treatment can be vastly different. So something to keep in mind with uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage as a secondary cause of uh, uh, SIADH. So let's continue. Uh, besides CNS, uh, obviously there's many drugs that are uh, associated with uh, SIADH. These are drugs such as carbamazepine, uh, chlorpropramide, uh, SSRIs can also cause um, SIADH. Uh, cyclophosphamide can also cause SIADH, and this is actually very difficult to deal with because cyclophosphamide has a can lead to increased ADH, which would make you want to restrict fluid, but it can also lead to hemorrhagic cystitis, which is an indication to give more fluid. So depending on what you're dealing with, you might want to restrict or give too much fluid. So that, that can be kind of tricky to deal with uh, when, you get, when you have a patient on cyclophosphamide. Uh, Desmopressin, which is obviously an uh, ADH analog, so you definitely think about it, but remember, it's also used in the treatment of von Willebrand's disease. And oxytocin, which I think many uh, women use for uh, labor, induction of labor. Uh, beyond that, we, uh, many tumors uh, can lead to um, SIH, such as small cell lung cancer. Uh, this, is, this small cell lung cancer has a, uh, what is it called, perineoplastic syndrome, which leads to uh, ADH production. Uh, many head and neck tumors uh, and cancers can lead to it, and as well as uh, olfactory neuroblastoma. So that's actually another cause as well. Uh, interestingly enough, um, many 
pulmonary conditions can also lead to uh, SIADH. And this can be as simple as pneumonia. Uh, actually, pneumonia is the most common cause of it, but you can also see it in asthma, ARDS, uh, atelectasis as well, and many other uh, pulmonary symptoms. So in general, whenever you have a patient with CNS symptoms and pulmonary symptoms, you may also see SIADH, so something to take consideration. Uh, surgery, another cause, uh, this could either be surgery to the pituitary. Also, there's a theory out there that uh, the pain uh, sensors can actually increase ADH, so I thought that was interesting. Um, beyond that, there are some endocrine abnormalities, such as hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism itself can lead to increased ADH, so something to keep, consider. And finally, there is uh, some hereditary conditions. Uh, primarily, the one that I've read about was the V2 receptor mutation. So pretty much the V2 receptor without stimulation is becoming stimulated, and that's going to lead to uh, this perception of uh, SIADH. But again, with this one, they might uh, it just, it's just going to be the, the symptoms of it. So you probably understand. So uh, now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and shift our focus. We're going to look at the how to treat um, SIADH. So the first thing you want to do is, of course, uh, try to f uh, recognize the underlying cause and treat it. So if this is a p uh, pneumonia, treat the underlying infection. If they're taking a medication, discontinue the drug, etc. So anything that's causing it, treat the underlying uh, condition, and usually that can actually reverse the SIADH. Uh, beyond that, the thing that you primarily want to focus on, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, is you want to correct the hyponatremia. So you want to correct the sodium. But be careful, never correct uh, sodium greater than 9 milliequivalents per liter within 24 hours. Otherwise, you can lead to a condition caused, uh, called osmotic demyelination. Now, I also um, mentioned, uh, so this, uh, sorry, so how would you correct the sodium? Uh, the way you'd correct it is, by fluid restriction. So if you can restrict the fluid to less than 800 milliliters per day, that's usually enough to start getting the uh, serum sodium to increase. However, like I mentioned before, uh, when you have patients with uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, you want to be more careful with fluid restriction. That's because if you, get, if you get, give them fluid restriction and you drop the blood pressure, that they're at increased risk for having either a cerebral vasospasm or a sudden infarction, uh, because that um, and and this and this again is because of low blood pressure. So uh, uh, by dropping the suddenly the uh, fluid the fluid volume, uh, the, you can actually make things worse for them. Also, you want to keep in mind that uh, if they have cerebral wasting syndrome, they're um, they're wasting a lot of sodium already, and ADH is a secondary reason for it. So uh, 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 for uh, the the wasted sodium. So that therefore, in patients with SA uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. There is no fluid restriction, so be very careful uh, when you see that. Otherwise, you do want to give these patients hypertonic saline IV, uh, and hypertonic saline IV obviously has a higher concentration of sodium, and this will uh, decrease, sorry, decrease renin and your intestinal testosterone system and increase the A and P. But this time, you have a lot of more sodium, so that even though you're you're both having salt and water loss. Since you have a lot more sodium, you can afford that water loss. So this is pretty much the mainstay of treatment, is to give that hypertonic saline IV with the fluid restriction. Um, you also want to go ahead and give them increased uh, solute intake. So by giving them more solutes, again, uh, you're replenishing, because this is going to be the primary system being used for getting rid of the water, you're replenishing the sodium loss that's occurring so that you, that water loss can just occur without uh, affecting your uh, sodium, uh, sodium levels much. And this, you know, you can just give oral salt tablets and you can give urea. Um, you, you do want to consider giving them loop diuretics as well. And that's primarily done if the urine osmolality is greater than 500 milliosmoles. Um, beyond that, there, are, there is a vasopressin antagonist. So this would obviously block the effects of ADH at the kidney level. And this is two drugs, Tolvaptam, which acts on the V2 receptor, and Conovaptan which works on the V2 and the V1A receptor. So less specific, but uh, still works. Uh, beyond that, um, the meclocycline, which is a tetracycline, also is uh, an ADH inhibitor, and lithium. So lithium uh, blocks the expression of the aquaporin uh, channels. So uh, this is going to pretty much wrap up the discussion on SIADH. Hope you learned a lot, and I'll also see you in my future videos.